Hi friends, today we are going to be painting a watercolor of the Olympic National Park. If you have ever been out to Washington State, and particularly out to the coast, you know that there are some gorgeous landscapes and scenes just begging to be painted, so that is what we are going to be doing today. Right now I am sketching out a rough outline for what we'll be drawing. I'm using one of my photographs from a trip as a reference photo. Isn't that gorgeous? I'm starting with wetting down the paper for the sky. I want to do a wet on wet technique here. I'm going to start off with a blue along the top and then I'm going to mesh that with some orange down along the very bottom. And when you're first laying your colors down, they'll always dry a little bit lighter than what you're doing here. So don't worry if it looks a little bit intense when you first lay it down like that orange did, because they will blend into each other really beautifully. I'll put that reference photo up on the screen so that you can continue to look at it and the painting as we go along. I might move it around the screen a little bit, just depending on where I go with the video. Right now I'm adding a little bit of purple in the background. You can see that there's some hazy coastline in the back as it fades into the distance. And it's got this really warm, glowy quality to it because of the sunset. So I wanted to be sure to capture that with my colors here. So they're leaning a bit warm, especially along that left side of the painting. Then I'm mixing up a bit more blue and brown and for this, I want to start emphasizing the bluffs that are over on the right side. I'm starting with a brown that I'll definitely need to make darker. You can see that the bluffs are almost black in the photo. And when you're working with watercolor, you're always working from light to dark. I could probably start a little bit darker here, but I like to err on the side of being a little bit lighter than I need to be. So we'll darken that as we go through the painting. Now I'm starting to add some of that driftwood and a little bit of the sand that's extending out into the water. Going back and adding some more purple to that coastline in the background, doing a little bit of a glaze there. That layer had dried and I came back in and added another layer of purple to that. Now I'm adding a bit of a darker layer to this bluff and starting to add a little bit of texture along that edge to make it look a little rocky and a little bit rough. There's not too much visual texture on this cliff aside from along the edge and then the very face of it that is still getting some of that sunlight from the sunset. And then I'm just placing where I want my trees to be. And when you're painting evergreens, when you look at them in real life, especially when you are thinking about painting or drawing them, you'll really notice how unsymmetrical they are. <laughs> like these are very, you can see, especially in the reference photo, there's a lot of, there are a lot of branches on the top middle tree and it gets pretty sparse down below that. Painting and drawing are a great way to really become a good observer of what is around you. Because in your head, I think, you know, most of us maybe have a picture of an evergreen tree as kind of a cone shape, but in real life, it is very different than that. Now I'm adding a bit more blue to the sky. I really like to create vignetting in my paintings and focus you know, darker toward the edges, especially the corners, so that more of the focus stays in on the center and the point of focus in the photo. Adding a bit more brown to that cliff in the background. They start to fade into the distance, so the one that is closest to the viewer, the one that's closest to you, is going to be the darkest, and then they'll become progressively lighter as they fade into the background. I'm adding a bit more layer to that sand. If you've been along the Washington and Oregon coast, you know that you get these really beautiful flat tidal plains up near the coast. They're so gorgeous. 
and you know the water comes up really flat and smooth up along the sand so sometimes you'll get little peaks of the sand out into the water adding a bit more darkness to that bluff and then I'm starting to add a little bit more to the driftwood that's along the front even in front of that bluff I don't want too much detail on that because I want the focus to be on the bluff and the water and the trees, but I do want to capture the fact that there's definitely some texture along the sand. I'm going back up into the trees right now and using the very point of the brush to create those trunks and then add some more of those pine needles. They're pretty far away, so you won't really see individual branches and definitely not individual needles, but you do want to emphasize the fact that there are different branches there. And you can see they're pointing in all kinds of directions. I'm further emphasizing the horizon line here and adding in some of the rocks that are along the left side. And then I'm creating a bit more of a wet wash along just the sky portion. And I want to come in and add a lot more blue. And again, this will fade down a little bit as it dries. So even though it looks pretty intense right there, it'll calm down a little bit. As you get used to your paints, you'll get used to how they act, you know, based on how wet your paper is, how wet your brush is, and how pigmented your paint is. I'm using the Winsor & Newton Cotman set here. This is a small travel set. It's great for travel. It's very compact. And I'll be sure to tag the, the products that I'm using down in the description in case you're on a painting journey of your own. I'm adding some orange to the bluff right here. I wanted to pull in some of that complementary color to make that pop a little bit more. It's subtle, but adding in that orange on the bluff really helps create some contrast with all the blue tones that are in this painting. I'm going back and darkening up those trees a little bit. I like to have some texture to my trees, so you'll see a range of values. Mostly they'll be dark toward the end of the painting, but you will see some mid-tones, even some light tones, to imply that there are more trees extending back or branches that extend back and away from the viewer. I'm adding in some more of those, a little bit more trunk detail. and then darkening a bit more along that bluff. It's a little tough to see in the picture here, but there is some texture. It's not just a flat, dark brownish black. On the right side there, there are variations in that depth. And then I'm carrying some more of that shadow up from the sand up into the side of that bluff. Now I'm picking up a little bit more orange and mixing it with that purple and carrying that into the background. I am really loving those warm tones as this fades back. The time of day that you take a picture or that you're using in a reference picture really helps inform the tones that you'll use in your painting. So this is at sunset when everything is really warm and glowy and you have that golden hour light going on that's just so magical. So these tones are a little bit warmer. And as you fade into night, you would notice that if you were to take a picture that time, the tones really start to cool down and have more of a blue undertone to them. My paper is mostly dry at this point, since I want the detail that I'm adding in right here to have a little bit more definition to it. When I first started the painting, I was wetting down the paper only on the front side, uh, since this is a relatively small piece, and um, doing the washes for the sky and for the water. And then as I start to progress through the painting, I'll do more of a wet brush on dry paper technique 
so that I can get more detail and finer lines. So you'll see me go back through and really add a lot of layers to areas like these trees and then uh, down along the shoreline. I added an extra tree up in the right. I felt like it needed a little bit more something up in that right hand corner. <laughs> when you're using a reference photo, definitely don't feel like you need to capture every last little detail. And, you know, just as you can take details out, you can also bring details in, like that extra tree in the upper right. I did take out a couple of the rocks that are out in the water. I didn't want, they're a little bit darker. Uh, and since that area along the left side, the painting is so light, I didn't want to have a bunch of visual weight, even though it would be smaller, tinier rocks. I didn't want to have too much pulling your eye over in that direction, just a little bit to further emphasize the horizon line. Now I'm adding in some variations on that blue. I'm using a bluish gray to help define some of those very flat waves that are coming in. They're pretty shallow by the time they get up this far on the shore. So I'm using mostly lines and dashes to emphasize and create the illusion that waves are coming in. And then the water is actually a bit darker back along that horizon line. So I'm going in and darkening that along the painting, picking up a little bit more pigment on my brush and carrying it over to the coastline and then also down below some of those darker rocks that are on the left side. Let me know your thoughts on having the reference photo up while I'm doing the painting. Do you find that helpful, even though it's small? I still want you to be able to see the color mixing that's going on here. So much of this I'm drawing from these wells that are in the palette, and then every now and then I'm going in and picking up more pigment. I like to work with a really limited palette. There are even more colors in this palette than I technically need to be using. Um, but I find it really nice just to be able to mix up my own tones. When you're, if you're first starting, you might find it more helpful to have a palette that has colors that are pre-mixed for you. Um, that kind of goes against the advice of a lot of art teachers because it does really help to know the fundamentals of color mixing. But if you're just wanting to get into painting, and get going and you don't want it to be you don't want to have to be thinking too much about how to get the colors that you need that can be a good way to go if you start to get more serious about painting i think you'll find it helpful to dive a bit more into color theory if you'd ever like me to do a video on that just let me know but it really you really have a lot of control over the tones and values and shades that you create when you're mixing up your own colors. And as you get used to it, um, and you'll probably get used to it a lot faster than you would think, it is really freeing. And then you don't need to be schlepping around <laughs> massive palettes with you. Okay, I'm adding a bit more darkness to those rocks. I want them to stand out just a little bit more. I do use a dryer on the layers in between uh, the different details that I'm adding here because sometimes I get a little impatient and I just want to move the painting along. The other thing that you can do uh, if you feel that way is work on a few paintings at once and that way you're rotating between the paintings and you can let them air dry and have them ready by the time you circle back to your first one. Always make sure that your art is working for you instead of you working for your art. Now I'm mixing up a bit more green, like a greenish gray, bluish gray that I'm using in the background here and then pour some shadows off those little rocks that are on the left side and then adding a little bit more detail to the beach here for the driftwood and really just implying that there's driftwood here. In the reference photo you can see more detail but I really just want the emphasis to be on the bluff and the sunset hitting the bluff. 
let's reveal that beautiful painting. I hope you love it, and I hope to see you again soon.